Hi, and welcome to the Haverhill Journal, where we give you a quick look each week at what's going on in our city. I'm Lindsay Paris, and this week, we're remembering a groundbreaking football game at Haverhill Stadium, learning about a new art center initiative gaining ground in the city, and seeing the historic steeple finally raised at East Parish Meeting House. But first, this past week, it's been impossible to miss the bare shelves at Demula's Market Basket, as store employees and shoppers continue their boycott to reinstate ousted CEO Arthur T. Demulis. The Journal visited three local market baskets to see firsthand how the dispute is affecting folks here in the Merrimack Valley. Good afternoon, shoppers, and welcome to your Haverhill Market Basket. If I could have your attention for a moment, please. First, we'd like to apologize for the condition of the store. It's not what we're used to, and we know it's not what you're used to. And again, we apologize for that. This is kind of crazy to ask you this, but it needs to be done. We need you to limit your purchases or not make any purchases at all. No matter what side you agree with, one thing that no one can deny is that something unique is happening in New England. Less than a month ago, Arthur T. DeMoulis, CEO of the Market Basket Shopping Conglomerate, was fired and the people who worked for him are showing their dissatisfaction. We're all showing our support for Arthur T, and we want to make sure he gets back. He, we want him back, we want to get him reinstated, and we're going to do everything we possibly can to help that cause. And we're asking people to uh, boycott Market Basket, unfortunately, because our loyal customers that have been loyal to us, and you know we love them dearly, but we need their help. Everything inside the um, grocery store is running, um, running low. A lot of people are getting fired. We need Arthur T back and how we can get everything together right. In this day and age, it's rare to see such fierce loyalty to a CEO. Good wages, generous benefits, and a down-to-earth, hands-on management style make Arthur T a star to his thousands of employees who worry that new management will bring reduced benefits and higher prices for shoppers that may lead to the company's demise. Well, in my eyes, um, Market Basket's going to cease to exist, um, not only as a, as a grocery store chain, but as a, the culture and the culture that it's established in every community that it's based in. He puts forward everything for the company and for our employees and for the consumers, um, and knowing that this other side, as we call it, has come in and they want all our profits to go to the shareholders to have their checks being cut be bigger every month, um, which is going to stop us from growing, which is going to stop the prices from staying so low. Um, if they take our profits, we, there'll be nothing. The Merrimack Valley is right in the heart of the controversy. Haverhill in particular has three supermarkets, and all of them are market baskets. Well, with respect to Haverhill, and it applies to all communities as well, if you dissolve um, a company like Market Basket, and take it out of the communities that it serves, um, I, I don't think I have to explain too deeply at how the effect in a negative manner is going to impact those communities. Not only with jobs, but higher, higher prices at the, at the grocery stores. We're very close to this store, so it's, it's tough to be going somewhere else for us. Who knows what's going to happen a couple of days from now. Yeah. It's well, to me, it's very scary and, and weird, yes. And we were kind of saying, should we go in or not? But it's like, we need cottage cheese. <laughs> so we had to come in, but it's a little scary, yes. Whatever the outcome, Haverhill stands to be affected by possible rising food costs and losses of jobs in the workforce. It's a domino effect from Massachusetts, for New Hampshire, for Maine. It's basically a no-win situation. It's bringing the country down. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for the employees. I've been with Market Basket for 38 years. I started off working on when I was 14 years old. Uh, I've been with the company for 26 years. Um, started out as a sacker. I've been doing this for 13 years, so half of my life. Market Basket is a great company to work for. It's a lot of things that, a lot of benefits with it, a lot of profit insurance with it as well. It is a big family, you know. Any any time, if you're in need of anything or whatever's going on in your life or history, uh, Arthur T. Demoulis takes part of it. You know, he's concerned. He wants to know what's going on. You know, he, he's he's like a big dad to all of us. You know, and growing up, that's the way he's always been. It's home. It's family. Um, it's 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 where I want to be. It's where I belong. And and I will do anything for this company, specifically Mr. Arthur T. Demoulis done a lot of good for the store, a lot of good for his employees. And, I mean, you can tell by the way that they're committed to him and, you know, they're willing to lose their jobs because of it. So, that says a lot. 
Thousands of customers wish Damula's Market Basket the best of luck and look forward to seeing things return to normal. To keep up with what's going on at Market Basket, visit wearemarketbasket.com. Haverhill has long boasted a rich history and strong presence in culture and the arts. Thanks to the efforts of several city residents, one of the most beautiful public buildings in the city, the Cogswell School in Bradford, may be finding a new purpose as a vibrant artistic and cultural space. For over a century, the laughter of Bradford school children filled the halls of the Cogswell School here on South Main Street. The building has been vacant for two years, but now a local community group is planning to breathe new life into Cogswell. Photographs of the building were on display at the Buttonwoods Museum last month for the exhibit Empty Halls, Photographs of Cogswell School, part of the Cogswell Art Center Initiative's effort to promote the creation of a dedicated art facility for the residents of Haverhill. So this exhibit kind of launches our campaign um, to raise awareness for an art center at Cogswell School. So we got this idea to have an art center because Danielle and I met through a mutual friend and he was doing something similar up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire and we said why don't we have an art center in Haverhill or a dedicated facility to run community arts events for all residents. Oh, I've been driving by this building for a long time and I've thought how wonderful it would be to do something with it rather than it to become more condos and so I've been in conversation with um, different people in the city about what we could do there and the conversation has just kept going. Cogswell, opened in 1891, remained in use as an elementary school until 2002 and continued to host after school and early childhood programs until 2012. Architect W.P. Phillips designed the building in the distinctive Richardsonian Romanesque style with arched recesses, cupolas, and a spiral stair tower. You may have noticed that Cogswell is built in a different style than other Haverhill public schools of the era. That's because this was the last public building to be built by the town of Bradford before it was annexed to Haverhill in 1897. It's just filled with beautiful arches from that period of architecture and all the rooms are painted like you would imagine a school to be painted and um, just bunches of desks pulled together and old-fashioned chairs and it just after I spent a little time there it's just you could spend forever there photographing all the nooks and crannies and all the evidence that a school <laughs> exists or existed there yeah I didn't have any idea of what to do photographically except that I wanted to find a desk where I would have sat had I been in that school. I want to take a picture of what I would have been looking at. And uh, there weren't any desks set up, so that didn't happen. But I do remember the water fountain when you were a kid. That was a big deal. So I found the water fountain. I've been driving by this building for a long time, and I've thought how wonderful it would be to do something with it rather than it become more condos. The building just, it lends itself to this. As soon as you walk in, you see all this natural light. I mean, it's just perfect for something like this. And you can imagine all these children when it was alive, and it's, I love going into the building right now, seeing the possibility. We got notification from the Mass Cultural Council that we received a feasibility and technical assistance grant to study the feasibility of the school and turning it into an art center. It's a matching grant, so we will be responsible for raising $9,000. Um, so with this exhibit, we're hoping to raise awareness for the grant, but also the project build community support and launch both the feasibility study of the building and a fundraising campaign. We hope there will be a designated gallery space for community members, for school groups. Um, education will be its primary focus, so there's eight classrooms now and we hope to repurpose almost all of them for classroom activities, after school programs, adult programs at night, weekend workshops, um, any arts related discipline you could think of. But there are also a lot of community arts groups, writing clubs, book clubs, um, there's Spotlight Theater, who have Experimental Film Festival, these great things happening in our town that don't have a place to go. So we're hoping we can be the space for them and provide a spot to run their programs. 
The Coxwell Arts Center isn't slated to open until 2017, but local residents are already looking forward to being a part of it. I'd love to see it again as an educational or a community building, and I'm really excited about the Art Center. There's a lot of really good things going on, but to have a home that can be the base to really promote all of the artists that are in town. I'm really excited for the Cardwell Arts Center. I love doing art. For more information on the Cogswell Arts Center initiative, visit their Facebook page at facebook.com backslash arts Cogswell. Believe it or not, at one time, you could have scored a front row seat for one of the East's most successful sports franchises right here in Haverhill, and that seat would have only run you $1.50. Okay, so back then they may have been an upstart league and a brand new conference, but the journal's Gabe Waters is giving us the skinny on the day the Boston Patriots came to town. Imagine yourself here at Haverhill Stadium, July 26, 1960. 6,500 fans fill the stands to watch the Patriots play their first ever scrimmage. The team came to the city via the Haverhill Lions Club, who convinced then owner Billy Sullivan to bring the new American Football League's eighth franchise to the stadium to raise money for the Lions Eye Research Initiative. With only eight days of preparation, the Lions managed to organize an event that would be the talk of the city. Coach Lou Saban had the tough job of taking the 61 players that played that night and knocking it down to a 33-man roster for the Patriots exhibition game against Buffalo later that week. On the field, legendary kicker Gino Capaletti, defensive end Bob D, top Patriots draft pick Ron Burton, and quarterback Butch Sagan were some of the stars of the evening. Burton scored a 25-yard touchdown in the first period. Receiver Jim Colclough brought in a 20-yard pass, and Capaletti kicked a point over the stadium wall into a neighbor's yard. The entertainment for the evening featured Miss Haverhill Jean Como, the VFW Shoemakers Band, and local singer Joe Pepe. After the game, Miss Como presented Coach Saban with the key to the city. After all was said and done, the Lions Club earned $2,600 for its eye research charity. After the game, the Patriots went on to a 5-9 record for the 1960 season. They changed their name to the New England Patriots in 1971 when they joined the NFL. So the next time you tune in to watch the Patriots at Foxborough, just remember that they got their start right here in Haverhill. I'm Gabriel Waters for the Haverhill Journal. Very cool story. Maybe someday we'll see the Patriots come back to Haverhill. Because hey, you never know. After 13 long years, East Parish Meeting House finally has its steeple back. The morning of July 10th saw a team of workers, including Dave Huey, Keith Huey, Soren Sebao, and Jean Legassi, bring in a crane and lift to raise the approximately 35-foot bell tower with its church bell back in place. The steeple raising took over four hours to complete, but it was an exhilarating day for the East Parish Meeting House Society, who has been raising funds for the bell tower's restoration since it was taken down in 2001. The public is welcome to stop by and ring the bell when the building is open. Congratulations to Shannon and Dave Huey, Bobby Rofo, and all the Meeting House supporters for a job well done. If you have a story or event you'd like to see featured on the Haverhill Journal, call us at 978-372-8070 or email info at mediahc.org. And don't forget to like us on Facebook or at our YouTube channel, HCTV Haverhill. I'm Lindsay Paris, and we'll see you next time.